jokingly refer to Sukkot as the uh, eight day, seven day festival because it really feels like it's one thing in some, some respects, but it's not, it's uh, two separate things. There's seven days um, uh, of, of rejoicing before the Lord that are commanded uh, very clearly. It is, uh, all of it is a time of, of rejoicing. Uh, and then on the first day, and then the eighth day, which is where we're at, Shimini literally means uh, eight or eighth, um, more specifically, and Atzeret is a assembly or gathering. Uh, so on the first day and the eighth day are uh, they're Sabbaths, they're, they're, they're uh, holy convocations, they're solemn assemblies, uh, called by different things depending on the English translation that you are reading. Um, and I feel a little extra out of sorts today because I normally set my alarm around 4.45, 4.50 in the morning because I like to ease into my Shabbat and have plenty of time to shower and take care of the dog and do things we gotta do or I gotta do and then uh, spend time uh, in the Word. It's not that it's a, a time of study per se, but it's, it's uh, I got to get all these verses in my head and kind of get the flow and and try to hear you know any last minute changes because you know he's he's the one that gives the marching orders I'm just uh, carrying them out best I, I possibly can uh, but for some reason my uh, alarm did not go off this morning and uh, I was about an hour late waking up so it kind of threw me off a little bit so hopefully doesn't affect things too much. But, um, so who, who is doing it? Josh, are you gonna be doing the reading today? Yeah, I can read. All right. So, um, if you are on the app, you can go into message notes, click on resources, and just uh, search their alphabetical order, apparently. So, just search for Shemini Atzeret, and uh, you'll have all of the verses. We're gonna be predominantly in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, Exodus chapter 40, Revelation 21 and 22. Um, but we will kind of talk about that as, as we get. I guess, first of all, uh, Josh, if you could read Leviticus 23, but just verses 33 through 44 to get us started, please. 23 verses 33 to 44. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the Feast of Booths, for seven days to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work. These are the set feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a meal offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, each on its own days. Besides the Shabbatot of the Lord, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord, however, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruits of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord seven days, on the first day shall be solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be solemn rest. You shall take on the first day the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall keep it a feast of the Lord seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall keep it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days, and all, all who are homeborn of Israel shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths, when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim in the Lord your God. Moshe declared to the children of Israel the set feast of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Um, so that is basically our framework uh, for this day. You know, one of the greatest uh, things about um, being in this situation, the position that I am in as, as a rabbi um, is, you know, there's a certain level of, of study that is required above and beyond when I wasn't. <laughs> uh, even the associate rabbi, you know, when I was just a, just a believer or even, you know, 
when I served as a you know, pastor over a media department, I, I didn't hardly ever have to, I think maybe it was like once or twice uh, in, in all of the, the years I, I did that, that I ever taught anything at all. It was always behind the scenes stuff. And uh, to be honest with you, you, know, you can tend to make a, a person a little bit lazy with the word. Um, but you know, when I met Rabbi Cliff back in 2011, uh, give or take, uh, just a, a hunger came alive in me to study the word like, like never before and to learn the deeper things and to, and to find out, you know, exactly what Southeastern Bible College, now Southeastern University, taught me on day one in biblical interpretation. They taught, rightly so, that the Bible cannot mean something different today than it meant at the time it was written and to whom it was written the original audience, which of course is Jewish. But then, you know, they kind of get away from it. They, they, they sort of float it and then they leave it alone. Uh, but thank God in 2011, uh, like I said, I uh, met Rabbi Cliff and, and started down this path, uh, this quest for, for something deeper, the, the, the treasure, the hidden treasure. And uh, even now, you know, 14 months into you know, leading this congregation uh, as, as, as the only rabbi, it's, it's, it's an awesome responsibility that I take very seriously and, and I feel like I'm, I study a lot, a lot, a lot. Could always do more, but, you know, clearly, this may come as a shock to some of you, so hold your gasps, but, you know, I, I don't know everybody. Do <laughs> you find that shocking? <laughs> yeah, don't let that really Jewish last name fool you. I, I, I was not raised in it. Um, but, praise God, you know, when you learn foundation and, and you learn principle and you learn uh, really just how to build upon a foundation and what's required to know what's true and what's not and what's what's required and what's not because you know you, you've got the Torah which you know uh, I, I look at not just the, the Humash or the Pentateuch or the, uh, or the, the, the five books of Moses you know uh, obviously that is this Torah proper but you know all scripture is inspired so I look at it as one book uh, with 66 you know headings uh, if you would or subheadings uh, from Genesis to Revelation so it all has to fit together. Uh, the new can't make void the old and vice versa. The old, it's been said, is, is the, 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 the brich hadashah, the new covenant concealed, and the, and the new is the old revealed. It is one playbook, if you will, one, one screenplay, one consistent story. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we have all kinds of stuff added to it, the, the, the Talmud, all the rabbinical writings, and, and uh, all that that entails. And there is a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I never recommend uh, that you study that. Um, I mean, of course, you know, it's a free, free world. You're, you're free to do what you want. But here's the, here's the problem with, with Talmud. It, it is a lot of confusing stuff in there that can, can mess people up. There's a lot of stuff out there that is just out in left field. There's some really good stuff. And most of it is very, very, very dry. <laughs> so it's not exactly entertaining reading. Um, and then we have the problem nowadays where we've got internet, and we've got social media, and we have just <coughs> all kinds of teaching and all kinds of people claiming to be prophets and claiming to have knowledge and Jesus told me this and this is you know what I revealed and oh look now they're up to a million uh, subscribers they must be legit so you know but you always 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 when you hear something you've got to test the teaching you've got to test all things even stuff that I teach. I would never intentionally teach something incorrect. 
Uh, but heaven forbid that day uh, comes, I mean, pull me aside privately and we'll talk about it. And if I uh, find I am in error, I've, I've done it once before, uh, earlier this year, and I will come up and I will make the correction. Um, but there is an idea floating out there that somehow uh, this day, Shemini Atzeret, is, is a day of, um, of mourning, a, a sad day. Uh, it, it's a day to be, um, mourning is the only word I can adequately uh, use here. Uh, because out there somewhere in the ethos is this teaching that this lines up with uh, the great white throne of judgment. And when I heard it, I was like, hmm, it's interesting. But we always have to ask, where is that? Not just that, but anything that we hear that's hmm, interesting. And not something that we've heard before. We always have to judge it by the word. We gotta get in and we gotta dig in and we gotta find out when, where is it? Because if it's in there, we should know. And it can't be in there implicitly or, or veiled because eh, then it's speculation, it's opinion. And the greatest, uh, well, one of the greatest things, Rabbi Cliff taught me a lot of great things, but one of my favorites is that, and he would say this and I'm saying it uh, as well, is my opinion means nothing. And don't be offended, but your opinion doesn't mean anything either. We can share our opinions and have interesting conversations and, you know, and, and, and discussions, and that's wonderful, and, that, that's, and that's great, nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to teaching, we gotta be careful what, what we put forth as fact and what we put forth uh, that isn't fact. But we deliver it in such a way that it, it could, heaven forbid, seem as fact. And, and the idea is this, and, and you know, th there are arguments for it, but the reality is we're commanded for the seven days of Sukkot to rejoice, absolutely called to do that. These are statutes forever. And on this day, it's a holy convocation, an assembly. Uh, um, and when you look at that, there's, break down the original Hebrew for Solomon, and there is nothing in there that implies mourning. And in fact, I'm gonna show you something because uh, Josh, if you wanna come on up, uh, Leviticus 23 verses one through three. With God, first things are foundational and you have to build upon the foundation. You don't deconstruct the foundation to make, a, make an idea or a theory fit. You just can't do it. So if you would read verses 1 through 3, Joshua 23. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them, The set feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my set feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Shabbat of solemn rest. A holy convocation you shall do no manner of work. It is a Shabbat to the Lord in all your dwellings. All right, so six days you shall work, and on the seventh is a day of solemn rest. It's the same language in the English translation uh, as we read earlier in uh, verses 33 through 44, dealing with uh, Sukkot and specifically the eighth day of Shemini Atzeret. It is the, the day of solemn rest. It's a, a holy convocation. It's the same thing. And... Is Shabbat a day of mourning every week? Never. No. It's a, it's a time of seriousness. I mean, you know, we, we, we come and, and we stop and we, we, we do holy activity, set apart. We do things differently than we do the rest of the week. We set time aside for study. It's a time to make korban, to, to draw near to the Father. It's a time of, of physical rest. It's a time of remembering that six days God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. He set it aside as a pattern. And you can even get into, you know, like this is implicit stuff uh, where, you know, we get this 
the six days of, of or the six ages, the, the, the six uh, thousand year periods. If you've seen uh, the video on YouTube that we put out, Creation and the Mystery of History, where we line up the, the, the parasha, uh, the first seven parasha with the, the seven days of creation, and that's obviously six days of creation with the seventh day of rest, which is creation week, we'll call it. And then the, the six millennia, and what has generally transpired during each of those time periods, everything lines up. And it is very interesting. And you know, can we point to you know, scripture in there and say that this is absolutely what this is, and therefore the sixth millennia is done on this date? I mean, yeah, yeah you better not. But it's interesting, and, and when we look at things uh, like that, but Shabbat is intended uh, to be a slowdown day, a, 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 a focus day, or a recentering day uh, upon the Lord. And, you know, whether or not, you know, that lines up with Armageddon or, or Great White Throne of Judgment or any of these things, if it happens to, it happens to. And those are future events, not now. And in, in the meantime, we are to be about the Father's business and to study his word. And when his festivals say to rejoice, we rejoice. And, and when they say to slow down, we slow down. So today's a day of, of slowing down. It's not a day of mourning. It's a, it's a, it's a high Sabbath. It's, it's kind of a double Sabbath. It's, a, it's, a, it's a Moed, a, a, one of the Moedim that falls on a Shabbat. So it's extra special. And I, I want to encourage everybody that we always, 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 always have to measure everything by Torah. That's our foundation. That's our North Star. That's our guide, guide posts, if you will, that we follow, that, that help us to know that we're on the right track. And uh, there, there's some other really... Uh, Cool things I want to talk about here, and Josh, if you come back up, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Exodus chapter 40. I think it's the first, it's really the whole chapter, it's 38 verses. So. All right, Exodus chapter 40. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall rise up the tent of the tent of meeting. You shall put the ark of the testimony in it, and you shall screen the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and set in order the things that are on it. You shall bring in the menorah and light the lamps of it. You shall set the golden altar for incense before the Lord of the testimony and put the screen of the door to the tent. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tent of the tent of meeting. You shall also set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and shall put water therein. You shall set up the court around it and hang up the screen of the gate of the court. You shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tent and all that is in it and shall make it holy and all its furniture and it will be holy. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offering with all its vessels and sanctify the altar and the altar will be the most holy. You shall anoint the basin and its base and sanctify it. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water. You shall put on Aaron the you shall put on Aaron the holy garments, and you shall anoint him and sanctify him, that he may minister to me in the Kohen's office. You shall bring his sons and put coats on them. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may minister to me in the Kohen's office. Their anointing shall be to them for an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moshe, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. It happened in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tent was raised up. Moshe raised up the tent and laid its sockets and set up the boards of it and put on the bars of it, raised up its pillars. He spread the covering over the tent and put the roof of the tent above on it. He took and put the testimony into the Tevia to Telva and set the poles on the ark and put the mercy seat above on the ark. He brought the ark into the tent and set up the veil of the screen and screen the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moshe. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the side of the tent northward, um, northward outside of the veil. He set the tread of the bread in order on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moshe. 
He put the menorah in the tent of meeting opposite the table of the side of his tent southward. He lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moshe. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and a burnt incense of sweet spices on it as the Lord commanded Moshe. He put the screen on the door to the tent. He set the altar of burnt offering at the door of the Lord, the door of the tent of the tent of meeting, and offered it on the burnt offering and the meal offering as the Lord commanded Moshe. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water therein with which to wash. Moshe, Aaron, and his sons washed their hands on the tent uh, on their, and their feet there. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they came near to the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moshe. He raised up the court around the tent and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moshe finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tent. Moshe was not able to enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud stayed on it and the Lord's glory filled the tent. When the cloud was taken up from over the tent, the children of Israel went onward throughout their generation, throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they didn't travel until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tent by day, and there was fire in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And uh, two things before I uh, jump back in here. Uh, I was reminded in my, uh, my thoughts that I know we have a few people here that have uh, trouble hearing. Is, is everyone okay with the volume today? Anyone not okay with it? Can you get it up a little bit? All right, Josh, can you put it up a little bit? Sorry about that. And uh, I wanted to make sure we took care of that. And then also as an aside, um, just so you know, I, I, uh, I do have a great friend uh, who is Jewish, who is a rabbi uh, messianic up in the Boston area, and uh, Rabbi Henry Morse of uh, Shara HaShalom. Um, and I discussed with him this whole idea too, and he's been a rabbi for 35 years. And he's a little bit more experienced than me, so, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. And uh, we had a long discussion about this whole thing. And yeah, he never heard of it being associated with anything to do with mourning or, or the throne of judgment. And again, we always have to bring it back to scripture. So the idea behind bringing up Exodus chapter 40 here, I was re you know, reminded of uh, this past week and how we're called to dwell in booths because the Lord you know, for 40 years had uh, the children of Israel uh, dwelling in temporary shelters in the desert. And we know again, one day uh, during the millennial reign, we will again uh, dwell in uh, Yerushalayim uh, with the holy city, with the Lord and, and all of the wonders that, that await us there. And we will uh, dwell in booths there. And it's a, it's a reminder in my mind uh, of the frailty of life because remember again Deuteronomy I think it's eight verse two is one of my favorite verses <laughs> God says I brought you out of Mitzrayim out of Egypt out of sin or bondage that's what Mitzrayim means and I brought you through the wilderness all of these years to test you to prove you to see whether it was in your heart to keep I meant to keep my commands not whether or not you did just whether or not it's in your heart and it was during this time in the wilderness, this time of testing, that, that we see that they were tested at every hand, at every side they, they were tested. And the frailty of life, it's, I'm all too familiar with, you know, with my testimony and my, my background in health issues um, that I won't bore you with again, but Life really is fragile. The toughest amongst us, the, the most muscular, the most physically fit, the most, you know, uh, strongest, are frail, unbelievably frail. You know, literally uh, a heartbeat away, uh, a breath away 
from eternity at any given moment. It's only for the grace of God that he keeps us here, that he sustains us, that he protects us, that he brings us through and provides our every need. And when we look at what John said in uh, chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then down to verse 14, uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Uh, some versions uh, come right out and say it, and he tabernacled with us. It's a picture of him taking on the frailty of human flesh. And in Exodus chapter 40, when uh, Moshe was commanded to set up the Mishkan, um, man, I mean, if you actually read how, how, it, how it says, you know, God's given the instructions to Moses on how to set it up. And then it doesn't say Moses got his construction crew together and set it up. It says, and he set up the sockets and he set up the poles and he put the covering and he certainly explicitly seems to indicate that it was Moses uh, operating alone and that gets into some really weird stuff in the, in the Talmud that, that talks about how he did it daily for seven days it's not in the Torah so yeah interesting but nothing to hang your hat on but the point is that, that he did it and why did he do it remember God told Moses to build for him uh, a, a house Moses, what are you talking about? How, how in the world can, can that happen? You're God. You're everywhere. But in the fashioning of this Mishkan, that the Lord came and uh, essentially indwelt, his presence filled it so heavily, so, so fully, Moses could not enter. And the glory covered that tent as they traveled through the wilderness. It reminds me of Yeshua who took on a frail sukkah of flesh and how we're, we're told after his immersion by Yochanan in the Jordan that, you know, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and rested upon him. And he walked in power and in and might. And it was all, all that you read in scripture. It was amazing. And then, you know, you fast forward to, to the idea of the, of the sukkah during these past seven days. And we're reminded of our frailty. We're reminded of how we live inside of tents. This is our tent. And one day when our time is done we'll be called home whether by shofar or whether by uh, decree of the king that he calls back his breath. That we walk as believers we ought to walk Filled with his chavad, with his with his with his presence, with his glory, with with his ruach hakadosh, should indwell us. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And likewise, in the wilderness, when you know. When the Holy Spirit was on the move, what did they do? Kick back and say, see you later? See you when you come back? No. They got up and they followed. Where he went, they went. Where he stopped, they stopped. Where he encamped, they encamped. And after, you know, for those of you that, that camped this week, I hope and I suspect that the presence of the Ruach was palpable. And I pray you had that experience. But whether you did or you did not, and whether you felt that 
or you didn't feel it. The reality is, again, as believers, whether we feel it, whether we know it, whether we see it, whether we understand it or not, he is with us. We are promised. We are sealed. We are We are vessels that contain his word. If you've got one verse memorized, you've got his word hidden in your heart. Now, I suggest if you only have one verse hidden, you might want to get cracking and get a few more. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the word is the sword that the spirit wields. And if you only got one or two verses, you got an itty bitty sword to fight with. And uh, that's not necessarily going to cut. So I would, uh, I would work diligently in the days that we find ourselves to ensure that your heart is full of the word and that you are strengthened. And I would suggest that as we go through this, the eighth day, a solemn assembly, we have gathered. We have worshiped, we have praised. We've looked at and studied his word. And as we ultimately leave this place and head back to our homes and, and prepare ourselves uh, to, to, to separate the holy from the profane and, and, and to enter into another week I pray that it doesn't escape us the wonders and the beauty of this season that the Father has brought us through. Amen. From 40 days of repentance from Elul, uh, the first day through Yom Kippur, through the rejoicing through Yom Teruah and the sounding of shofars, and to the dwelling in booths and everything that went into all of it. And it can be tiring, it can be exhausting, it can be uh, a lot of different things, but above all else, it is wonderful and beautiful and something that all of us uh, should be thankful for. The challenge is, after today, up until the spring feasts start again, start anew, that we carry all of this with us. The memory of the, the closeness of the Father and, and the frailty of life and the gravity of our sin and the mercy and grace of, of Yeshua poured out his blood. He is our atonement. We are a blessed people. And I want uh, Josh to come up and just read a, a couple more things. They're short verses from uh, Revelation 21 and 22. And I just want to, uh, we'll, we'll close with this. I, I just want this to be in your heart. Because one day again, Sukkot will be celebrated in Yerushalayim, Zechariah chapter 14. Yeshua will split the Mount of Olives. And uh, Jew and Gentile will be there. The Jews will see, they will look upon him, and they pierce, and they will mourn. And we're going to have a millennium. On this earth, heaven is coming down. We always talk about how we want to go to heaven, and yeah, and right now it's, you know, <laughs> wherever it is, right? But there's coming a day where the holy city will descend, and the new Jerusalem will be right there, right over the old Jerusalem. And it's going to be beautiful, and it is something to look forward to. Josh, that 21, 1 through 7, please. All right, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I saw a new heaven and a new arrest. For the first time, heaven and the first earth 
the reds have passed away and the sea is no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice out of heaven saying, Behold, God's tent is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The first things have passed away. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said, Write for these words are faithful and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Top, the beginning and the end. I will give freely to whom who is to him who is thirsty from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes, I will give him these things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Amen. In Revelation 22, 1 through 3, he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street, of its street, on the side of the river, and on, that was the, and on that was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations. There will be no curse any more. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will serve him. Amen. That's all. Amen. Praise God. That river is pictured as uh, part of Hoshana, uh, Hoshana Rabbah. The War Libation Ceremonies, or Ceremony, and what Yeshua said about rivers of liberal, living water would flow, John chapter 7, we talked about last week. You know, one last thing, is I, my, it is my prayer that all of this, the culmination of all of the Moedim, and everything we've experienced this, this year on God's calendar and everything that we've been prepared for and everything that we've experienced. May all of us be stirred by the Ruach to share the Basora, the good news like never before. Our time is short. It's not sensationalism. It's not the scary. I don't know. You define short. I, I can't. <laughs> All I know is, is our time is limited. Whether that's hours or years, I don't know. But the signs are all around us. And the Father desires that we, his people, fulfill his great commission. We are called to go, to teach, to baptize, and disciple, and to share the gospel of salvation through the blood of the Lamb. May all of us endeavor to do just that every day, not just on holidays, not just on uh, rare occasions, but may it become a part of the essence of who we are. And may we all go deeper into his word this year than ever before, and may it bear much great fruit for the kingdom. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Yeshua.